Hello, and welcome to our Summer Scares Middle Grade panel. I'm Sarah Hunter, editor of the Books for Youth and Graphic Novel sections at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to Summer Scares resources and information were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the materials by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. We'd like to start today's webinar with a brief introduction to the Summer Scares program. For those of you unfamiliar, this is the sixth year we've released a Summer Scares reading list, which includes titles selected by a panel of authors and librarians and is designed to promote horror as a great reading option for all ages and during any time of the year. Um, I also am uh, want to note that we have an updated logo for the Summer Scares. Um, you'll see on this page here, uh, instead of the hand with a knife, um, there will be a werewolf arm. So in case any of you are interested, uh, that will be released later. Um, this program is designed by the Horror Writers Association in partnership with United for Libraries, Book Riot, and Booklist. As I mentioned earlier, we sent a link to the 2024 Summer Scares Programming Guide, but please feel free to ask for that in the Q&A box if you aren't able to locate it. We will be happy to share it with you. Let's get to the reason we're here today, our wonderful panel. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Romana Yi, author of My Aunt is a Monster from Random House Graphic, Kenneth Oppel, author of The Nest from Cy from Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers, and Justina Ireland, author of Ophie's Ghosts from Balzer and Bray. We will hear a brief presentation from each author about their book and then move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, first up today is Romina Yi, author of My Aunt is a Monster. Romina, please tell us a little bit about your book. Hi, hello. Um, so yes, I'm Romina Yi. I'm a strange and fancy um, artist, author, and designer. And this is my book, My Aunt is a Monster. So um, My Aunt is a Monster is a uh, 300 page um, adventure story about Sophia who is blind and is a huge bookworm and she loves adventure and she dreams about only like uh, going to the kinds of adventures that her favorite characters would go on. Um, but this all changes when she goes to live with a distant and mysterious aunt, Lady Wimsey, who also has a sequel of her own and will eventually um, take a Safia on the journey of a lifetime. Uh, so while the reclusive aunt Lady Wimsey stops an old Bible from uncovering the truth behind her disappearance, Safia meanwhile experiences parts of the world she had only dreamed about. But when an unlikely group of chaotic agents comes after Wimsey, Safia is forced to confront the Avenger head on. And for the first time in her life, Safia is the hero of her own story, and she must do what she can to save the day. Thanks, Rubina. And um, mm -hmm. it's in the title that her aunt is a monster. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Kenneth Oppel, author of The Nest. Thank you for joining us, Kenneth. Tell us a little bit about your book. Absolutely. Um, well, The Nest is is a story about uh, a boy called Steven. He's quite an anxious boy who has a new uh, baby brother. And his baby brother is is not thriving. Um, he has a number of health issues. Um, they don't really know the, the full extent of of his health conditions, but it's a very anxious time in the in the home. 
the first week after the baby is born. And Stephen, who's always been prone to having very vivid dreams, has has a, a dream in which uh, he's um, greeted by what seems to be an angelic figure who says, we're here to help. Uh, we're here because of the baby. And, and Stephen says in the dream, how can you help? And the angel figure says, well, we're, we're, we're going to fix the baby. And Stephen's quite interested and excited by this. And he said, well, how can you, how can you do that? How can you fix the baby? And the angel creature says, well, we're not so much going to fix the baby, Stephen, as, as replace the baby altogether. And Stephen goes from sort of elation to, you know, extreme trepidation and says, well, how, what do you mean? Uh, how how is it, where is this new baby coming from? And the angel creature says, "Well, well, Stephen, we're growing the new baby right now, in the nest outside your house." So Stephen wakes from this nightmare. You can call it a nightmare now. And um, and the next morning goes outside to his house, and indeed, right below the baby's window is a is a huge wasp's nest. And Stephen is very concerned that inside this wasp nest is is not a whole bunch of little wasps being created, but but some kind of baby creature and in subsequent dreams it seems that the thing he was talking to might not be so much an angel as perhaps a more wasp-like wasp queen he comes to call her um and the baby she's offering Stephen and his family will be absolutely perfect it will never be ill or, or afraid or anxious and all Stephen has to do to accept this wonderful gift is say yes he's, he's not at all sure he wants to to say yes um but the wasp queen is very um, persuasive um, and also very insistent. Um, so it's a choice that Stephen has to make, whether he's going to sort of help this uh, swap, this perfect baby for his ailing baby. Um, so it's pretty straight ahead, you know, kind of story about a, a baby growing in a wasp's nest. Uh, it's definitely much more than just that, but that's a good a good account. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Kenneth. Now we'll hear from Justina Ireland, who is here to tell us all about Ophi's ghosts. Take it away, Justina. Hi, I'm Justina Ireland. I'm the author of Ophi's Ghosts. Um, Ophi's Ghosts follows a uh, 12 year old Ophelia who lives in 1920s Georgia, and she, of course, is living, is a black girl in a time where it's not the greatest to be black. Um, one, at one point in the middle of the night, she has um, this kind of dream where her dad appears and because dreams are big and horror as we're seeing. And she is kind of, you know, wonders why he's there to put her bed. And he tells her, look, get your mom, get the money under the floorboard and get out of the house. And she doesn't know why there's money in the floorboard. So she tells her mom, her mom's confused as well. And no sooner do they get out of the house and head up the road than um, the people who just previously and then earlier in the night lynched her father for voting come and burn their house down. And that kind of sets off a whole uh, story for Ophia. She realizes that what she saw wasn't her father and wasn't a dream. It was her father's ghost. So she now realizes she can see ghosts. Um, when she gets to, you know, following the Great Migration, like a lot of Black people did in the 1920s, when they get to Pittsburgh, they move in with a distant aunt that she's never met. And she realizes that all of the women on her father's side of the family can see ghosts. They skip a generation every now and again, but for the most part, they have this ability. And so as her aunt's teaching her the rules for in interacting with ghosts, she gets a job at Daffodil Mount Manor working with her mother as a, a maid's assistant, ladies helper to an, an elderly old woman. And what she realizes is not only is Daffodil Manor completely haunted, but someone was murdered there and now she wants to know why. So Opie's ghost is really about not only dealing with the process of grief, um, because grief is a great way, horror is a great way to talk about grief and, and how we move on, but it's also about how do you kind of move past uh, racial, racial violence in your life, especially when it seems like nobody cares and no one's going to help. And that's Opie's Ghost. Thanks so much, Justina. I'm really looking forward to talking about it more during the panel, speaking of which, um, I'll invite all our authors to turn on your uh, cameras and now we can start the panel portion of the event. Um, thank you all so much for telling us about your books. Uh, I'm interested in the inspiration behind your stories. Um, Justina, why don't you talk a little bit about yours first? 
Sure. So I spent a lot of time uh, researching because most of my books are some version of historical fiction with the speculative element laid on top of it, um, whether it's YA, uh, adult or uh, middle grade. And in the case of Opie's Ghosts, um, I was researching for another book because it so happened as the case. And I came across the lynching statistics um, for my local county. And I live in this very nice county in Maryland where everybody will tell you that everyone was an abolitionist and everyone was part of the Underground Railroad and all this kind of stuff, but historically not true. Um, and so I got interested in this idea of lynching, um, especially around the turn of the century, because what you see with lynching is there's a whole bunch of it after the Civil War. It goes away during Reconstruction. And then there's a whole bunch of it again um, after the birth of a nation in the early 1900s, especially when Black people started to exercise their right to vote. Um, and so as I was researching these different lynching cases, especially in Georgia, I came across one that was particularly heinous where a woman's husband was lynched. She went out to get the police and said, my husband was lynched. You need to do something about this. And in retaliation, the mob lynched her. Um, but not only did they lynch her, but she was like seven months pregnant. So I kept coming back to this idea of if that's your family and that's your your history, how do you move past this? How do you move past these terrible moments? Especially now, we keep seeing. I mean, we, we now we we get lynching by the by the hour on on social media, right? It's kind of we can't escape it. The problem is, is kids also can't escape it. And so, how do you talk about these things with kids who soak up everything like a sponge without talking about these terrible things that we all kind of accepted as part and parcel of life? And unfortunate, but kids are like, why, are, why do these exist? And I, for me, the best way to talk about hard subjects is always at a slant. And I love ghosts and I love historical fiction. And so I was like, you know what, let's, let's start with the inciting incident that is true, that is something that's hard to talk about. And let's move from there and talk about it at a slant. So that's how Opie's Ghost came up. And then also, there's not nearly enough um, excellent middle grade books about the Great Migration, which was in the 19, uh, early 19, excuse me, 19 century early 20th century the early 1900s when a lot of black people fled the terror of the south for better opportunities in uh the north and created what we now call the black belt which is kind of just like this draw up the coast of like where black people live so cool yeah and like the the history you carry with you as a kind of a ghost is always like a really resonant horror trope that i am always drawn to um romaina why don't you talk a little bit about the inspiration for your book next All right, so um, My Aunt is a Monster, it was inspired by all the middle grade adventure novels that I love. So books like the Mysterious Bandit Society, the Autoline series, and the Far From Adventure series. And it is so inspired by the aesthetics of a lot of the whimsical horror media that I used to consume a lot. So things like The Adams Family and uh, the works of Edward Gorey and as well as the illustrator Chris Grimley. So My Aunt's the Monster originally started as a comedy novel for adults. So I have Alexander McCall's influence um, to tank. But generally, um, My Aunt's the Monster was kind of like a response to like this thing that I've always wanted to see more in uh in fiction generally, just something that is fun and silly and whimsical, like with weird characters and especially weird characters that can be role models for children. And I wanted to make my own version that I could pass down to the next generation of uh, quirky bookworms. And one thing that we were not really getting in this particular panel is like the visual aesthetic of the book is really um, inspired by like mid-century illustration. And you can see a lot of influences of like um, 1950s cartoons in the artwork, which I think is really interesting and adds to the whimsical atmosphere. Um, so that's something I think is good to know about your book too, Romina. Um, Ken, you're next. Tell us about the inspiration for The Nest. Oh, The Nest, it... And this was a story I'd been keeping notes on for a decade without really knowing what kind of story it wanted to be or, or how I could tell it. I knew I wanted to tell a ghost story of sorts. I liked the title, The Nest. I liked, I liked the idea of a story called The Nest. I didn't know what would be in The Nest. Um, 
And I had a wish list of things I wanted to be in the store. I wanted a Fisher Price toy phone that could communicate with a figure called Mr. Nobody. I know I wanted a knife sharpening van that would cruise up and down the streets, seen only by certain characters. And I knew I wanted uh, a baby growing inside a wasp's nest. So it was an unusual set of ingredients. I think uh, probably the biggest one personally was that um, around the time that I started taking notes of the story, I just had my third uh, child. Not me personally, my wife had the child, but I was I was the, the co-parent of this child. And uh, she was born with Down syndrome. And I started probably thinking an awful lot about um, how we, you know, view people, how we sort of uh, apply sort of values or labels to people. Um, and this was a whole new, you know, sort of line of thinking for me. And I, I guess in my, in my head, I had a whole sort of series of conversations um, between someone like the Wasp Queen and some other character. And I didn't know who that other character was, you know, until 10 years. And I realized it was, uh, you know, a boy, you know, like Steven, the main character, um, who has a, a new baby uh, sibling in his life. So it's it was a weird hodgepodge of places the story came from. And uh, more than any other book I've written, I, I did have a it, it had a theme up front, which I usually avoid. I try to avoid having a theme going into a story. My stories usually start with a premise or a, a setting. Um, and, uh, and I, and I find if there's any theme, it emerges naturally, but in this one, this story really, it was a, it was a story of temptation, um, of, oh, the dangerous lure of this idea of perfection labels like normal, what is normal, all these things we chase after, um, that really ultimately are quite, you know, destructive and limit human experience rather than enhance it. Um, so I think that's, it's a, it was a crazy you know, amalgam of, of things that came together for this book. Um, I, uh, when I sent you these questions, I had like them neatly organized into categories, but I think I'm going to skip around a little bit because um, you, you all have very different approaches to, to your novels, like different backgrounds. And I'm curious um, about what you think, just more generally speaking, what makes a good horror story for middle grade readers? What are the elements that um, you think are important to be there? Um, cause I think I'll get like a really nicely varied group of answers from all three of you. Um, Romina, why don't you go first for this one? What, what makes a good horror story for, for a middle grade reader? Uh, I think generally just something that keeps them turning the pages, like regardless of the reason, whether it's like their yeah, investment in the characters or in the themes or in like the, um, the, implications of like any of the supernatural like uh, that is being uh, explored in the story. So that's why I think makes a good horror uh, for middle grade readers. Justina, how about you? You touched on this a little bit, but I'd like, I'm wondering, can I expand on that a little bit? Um, for me, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I approach horror the way I approach anything, um, whether it's a Star Wars book or a, just a dry ass essay. Um, I just, just got to be engaging for the reader. And I think about for middle grade, to me, that's always about meeting kids at their level as though they are adults, not talking down to them, not writing down to them, not preaching. And I think as long as you do that, whether it's horror or anything else, I think you will, you know, you'll get a, a reader who's invested but for me as a horror reader, as an adult and as both a, a middle grade age kid, um, I liked the the surprise. Um, I didn't want plots that were predictable. Uh, one of my favorite books ever is Mar Wait Till Helen Comes by Mary Downing Hall. And still a fabulous read. I just reread it recently. Uh, so I'm almost on an annual read now. And it's the reason it works is because the way she builds that suspense throughout the book is you're pretty convinced it's not a ghost. You're pretty convinced it's not a ghost. And then you get to the end and you're like, oh crap, it's a ghost. And so I think for me, I always want it to be surprised. I think, especially nowadays where kids have so much text being thrown at them, they have so many distractions that if you can't surprise on the page, then you're never gonna, they're never gonna get past the first few chapters. So for me, it's always that, that element of surprise. And like Romina said, like, like those characters and those, those that you connect with as well are highly important. Mm -hmm. And what about you? How does that resonate with you? 
Um, yeah, that was, I, I agree with all, all those things. I, I mean, honestly, I didn't know I was writing a horror book. I still, I'm still resistant about the horror thing. Cause I, I, I hate sort of being, um, like, you know, crammed into any genre. Um, <laughs> I mean, I approach writing the nest, like almost like any other book. Um, but, uh, for me, it's the, uh, I, I like, I like creepy, but I like, a, you know, a tingle. I, I, I'm actually horrified at the idea of like horrifying children. And I think for middle grade, I, you know, I, I would be, I would be, I would feel bad if like I had traumatized a reader or given them, you know, lingering nightmares or made them anxious or uneasy. Um, so I think there's, I think it has to sort of resonate with the age of the kid. It has to be something that they can actually mean something to, to them and their, and their life. And I think, you know, what happens in your house and your family is, I think, at that age of the utmost importance. So I think this, you know, the things that really impinge on a kid's life are, are my, you know, are my parents happy? Are my siblings happy? Uh, do I feel safe? Um, so for me, um, I, I look at the nest sort of more like a fairy tale. I mean, because really it's, you know, it's a changeling story. You know, it's about being offered this perfect gift and is it perfect? And and the hero has to basically literally don armor and fight this wasp army at the end. And that's how I, that's how my impression is kids sort of receive the book. It's like, it's uh, it's at the level of, of fairy tale. So, and I think that's what enables kids to have, probably have a, <laughs> in a strange kind of way, a greater appetite and ability to absorb quite horrific things mm -hmm. that, adults we would see as just far too upsetting or terrifying um because when you think about fairy tales i mean it's there's there's you know baking people there's cannibalism there's a band there's any every terrible thing you can think of um but the kids just sort of absorb this at the level of other <laughs> something other that's happening elsewhere um and it's sort of a safe way to sort of you know encounter these 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 ideas or themes without without it being really truly terrifying to them mm -hmm. yeah as soon as you said it's sort of like a fairy tale my first thought was well fairy tales are quite scary I think so. <laughs> in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um and I think that uh you're right that they sort of touch on things that are like at a distance you you mentioned just in the beginning that you like to tell stories at a slant and the story of like some of the horrors of history at a slant and I think fairy tales do something very similar and I kind of like see a connection between the nest and Ophi's ghosts um, on, on, that, uh, on that point. Um, what kind of readers did you have in mind when you were writing your books? Did you write them to yourselves as children or are there other children who you were thinking of um, when you were writing your books? Justine, can we start with you for this one? Yeah, I actually wrote this book hoping it'd be the one book my kid finally reads of mine, but alas, <laughs> it is not. Uh, <laughs> so I really wrote it for them. Um, but I think what I hear back a lot of times from librarians and especially my local school librarians who I have a pretty good relationship with is it's it's one of those stories that you tell kids, okay, it's 1920s ghosts. They want to see what that looks like, right? And I think that's for me, as long as the hook is clean, I think you can get most readers. But I honestly, I'm always writing every book for me. I still read middle grade. I still read YA. I still read adult books. I love horror. I love fantasy. I love, you know, science fiction. So every time I sit down to write, I'm writing for me. Um, because if I'm not enjoying the book, nobody else is going to enjoy it either. So that's really good. And then like, again, as a kid, I was a voracious reader of horror. I read all the Goosebumps books. I read all the Betty Renright and Mary Donahue and like it just never stops. Stephen King in sixth grade. Like so, I was that kid, and so I I hope that the version of me, the small future writer version of me that's out there right now devouring books, picks up mine as well. <laughs> Ramina, who do you, who did you have in mind when you were writing your book? You talked a little bit about that before, but tell me more. Yeah, I'm pretty similar to Justina. Um, I usually write. Uh, something that I would read regardless of whatever stage of life that I'm at. And for my honest monster specifically, it's for the quirky and voracious bookworms who love like playing in the words in their head. So basically like me as <laughs> uh as like a elementary school student. So yeah, that's who I was writing for. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kenna? It was for it was certainly for me as as an 11 my 11 year old self um i mean it, 
but it's also it was also for me as a parent um as an adult so i feel like this in this book i was i i was every single character in the book i was i was the brother i was the parents i was the wasp's queen i felt like i i inhabited each and every one of those those characters so unusual an unusual experience for me uh writing the book um <clears throat> What are some of your favorite horror tropes just in general? Like what um, what are you always drawn to? Ramina, can we start with you? Like what's the what's the horror trope that speaks to you the most? Um, so I do have like two extreme modes of interest where on one hand I love an Adam's family as joy the weave around like the spooky you know like celebrating what makes something real you know and like poking fun at what people consider macabre um and then i also have the other end where i crave uh esoteric almost surrealistic kind of body horror you know of things like being rendered apart or becoming incomprehensible uh to the level of like it becoming uh almost divine in a way, you know, the divine as destructive, you know. So like that's the two extreme flavors of uh, <laughs> like two very different things. Yeah, they are two very different things. <laughs> I, I do I do enjoy those. <laughs> yeah. Are you a Jinji Ito reader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jinji Ito was quite influential when I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I wouldn't have expected that looking at your like very colorful and bright and cheerful cartoony artwork. That's uh, that's really funny. <laughs> uh, Kenneth, what about you? What's your go to horror trope? I like I like stories where uh, until you see the thing that you're you're scared of, like whether it's the monster or the ghost, I always find the most sort of intriguing, delicious moments are the, you know, the unseen is that anticipation. And really, I think it's because you get to do all the work as the reader or the viewer. You know, you supply. You're 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 the best person to make your own nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think anything anything that the reader or the writer flashes up or comes up on a film um, might be a disappointment. Um, so I like. I mean, connected to that, I like I like the horror stories, which are sort of the monster within. Um, you know, I don't like I don't like big Godzilla stories. They're too big. They're not they're not scary. But the things that that we're capable of as humans, those are. I think the the most sort of potent, like the most horrifying to me, what, what we are capable of, of. So Frankenstein stories, for instance, I think are kind of like, those are the kind of stories that light me up, things that we might set loose in the world on our own or create. Mm. Although, isn't that what Godzilla's about? He's too big though. He's too, you can see him coming. There's no, there's nothing to be scared of because you know, you just, you would evacuate, you just leave. You'd, you just leave, you know, before he ever got there. Like the little things, <laughs> little things that can crawl around, you know, under the floors. And that's scary. But mm. the big guy, I don't know. It's just me. <laughs> Justina, how about you? Tell me about your go-to horror trope. Um, I love when characters start off in the wrong place. So I love horror where we have somebody who is out of their depth before we even get started and the fish out of water, the... The, um, the person who goes to like the rich family vacation, but they grew up in like a trailer park. So I always like that, that person who is, who's been displaced from the, their comfort before the story even starts or at the beginning of the story. And then the horror unfolds, because I think for me, it gives you, there's like a level of meta narrative that happens there. So like, you know, if you're at home and it's like your comfortable house and you're like, oh no, there's someone in your house, there's like comfort being ripped away I like when the comfort's never even there in the beginning and so I tend to gravitate towards storytelling that's like that I also really really love when I'm watching or I'm reading horror as well it's even better over the top depth it's not a lot of things we get to in middle grade because you know it's for stuff for kids <laughs> but like the over the top depths where you have someone like dying in the most unlikely way or you have these beautiful set pieces of death i love that as well especially as a horror viewer um not like the like the saw movies where it's just torture and agonizing but stuff like final destination the original one where you just have these you know a roller coaster crashing off and landing on somebody like that's ridiculous you know the chances of that happening are less than getting struck by lightning but that's that's for me that's like catnip as a horror watcher and reader um uh 
this is maybe an odd question, but when you're watching horror, um, does it make you laugh? Not because you think it's funny, but because you don't know what else to do with yourself. I laugh at everything. So. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Except like documentaries about like genocide. Then I'm like, probably not time yeah. to laugh. But yeah, but no, I usually, I usually can figure out the plot. And so then I just narrate it back to my husband. And so it mm-hmm. immediately like steals the horror. That's what I do. How about everybody mm-hmm. else? Like I just. Yeah, does it make you laugh? It's a very worrying question, Sarah. I mean, it links me laugh into life. Like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. But not like, mm-hmm. ha ha, that guy got it. Had That guy totally needed to get detectated, right? Like it was just usually, unless of course the character needed to be detectated. Which I think it's def- it's when you fun. laugh, it's I, I see it as a defense mechanism because mm-hmm. you're sort of, you, some part of your brain shuts down because you can't cope. You don't, you don't know how to process, you don't know how to process all the stimulation. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I feel like it, sometimes I, I think I, I tend to avoid horror films because it's just not that kind of I, I I don't want those kind of images lodged in my head because as a teenager or an well preteen I was so scared by the movies I didn't even have to see them I would what I would do is I'd get my friends to tell me about The Omen or Rosemary's Baby you know or, or The Exorcist and then I'd still have nightmares and be terrified <laughs> I didn't even need to see it I was I was a really timid kid so um you know, I, I tend to uh, avoid them. I, I'm not I'm not quite that jaded yet that I, I need horror to jolt me to like some new mm-hmm. sort of experiential moment. Mm-hmm. I just keep I keep thinking about that frog and toad story. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where they what? they are listening. Uh, one of them is telling the story of the old dark frog, and they feel the shivers. And they at the end of their they sit together feeling the shivers and enjoying themselves. And that's like the sensation that that I like appreciate having about horror. And I kind of think that that's like what middle grade horror, in, in my experience, like that is when it's successful. Not when you're like four or five, but when you like get the shivers and you're like, whew, now we can move on and do something else. Does, it, does anybody else know what I'm talking about? The Frog and Toad story? Okay, good. <laughs> the coziness of it. There's a coziness yeah. to that. It's like, it's, but it's like, you're aware that it's just a story and you're mm-hmm. safe and you've got a cup of tea in your hand. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fun to hear the storm outside the house. Mm-hmm. Then it's fun, you know. Yeah. What, you about, what about you, Romina? Do you laugh at horror? Does it make you laugh? I don't really um, watch horror um, because I can't. Um, <laughs> because especially um, things that relate to uh, like ghosts or uh like like demons or anything like that because um it culturally it feels too weird to me because I cannot abstract uh like uh anything from the other side as mm. being uh fake because in Malaysia it's a web it's like like living with uh the spirits and living with like um like like ghosts or like anything like that. Is is a part of everyday life, hmm. and so and then we do have a lot of like taboos and a lot of like uh rituals and practices, you know, that uh always touches on like how do you behave in a forest? How do you behave when you are out at night? You cannot look over your shoulder, you know that kind of thing. So it feels too real for me and I think and I always feel that what like watching a horror movie that's about like ghosts or demons is like uh reminding me that those things are real so, <laughs> so I'm like I don't normally partake in that specific like brand but I do enjoy um the god hick or the macabre you know the kinds of like stories that uh like filmmakers like Guillermo del Toro uh like plays in mm-hmm. you know mm. like like the supernatural that uh like intersects with like fairy tales and folklore and history you know and all that kind of thing and um I feel I, I feel that I don't see that enough in uh like audiovisual media so I tend to find that in uh literature. I tend to find that in like uh like classic uh god hate novels or mm-hmm. like uh anything like that, or comics or anything like that. So uh I don't laugh at it, I guess that's my yeah. answer. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Fair enough. I was just curious. <clears throat> Why do you think kids are drawn to horror? Like what, speaking, you can speak from your own experience, but I'm also curious if you have like an idea about like what generally makes kids interested in reading horror. Um, Lamina, can we start with you? Um, so I think kids are drawn to horror because of uh, like the frankness of the genre itself. You know, like how horror is uh, upfront about, you know, life and death and all the emotions that tend to be brushed aside by the grown-ups around them. Mm -hmm. um, and horror also has a tendency for exploration and the celebration of uh, the traits that make us different or contrarian or counter-control. So, um, kids are drawn to that kind of honesty and uh, this kind of honesty is what carries with them mm -hmm. as they grow up and they learn more about the world and it will also like uh, give them with uh, realizations because um, like I think there are two layers of horror where there's uh, the surface and the subtext and mm -hmm. I think uh, the very nice thing about horror is that you get more from it as you get older, as you uh, have more experience in the world. So it's like when you go back to read or watch a piece of horror that you uh, experienced as a kid, uh, that second time reading it as an adult, it's like, oh, I didn't realize that uh, this book is talking about this subject, you know, it flew over my head because I didn't understand the context or the history or whatever it is uh, at the time. And yeah, so that's what I think um, gets kids uh, interested in the genre itself. Yeah. Justina, you are nodding your head there. <laughs> Did any of that resonate with you? Yeah, I was actually, as Ramina was talking, I was thinking about, I have it somewhere on the shelf and I don't know where it is, it's usually down here. Um, but so the first horror book I ever read as a kid was a pop-up book by Edward Gorey called The Dwindling Party. It's mm -hmm. really hard to find. If you ever see a copy at like a used bookstore or a Goodwill, snag it. It's, it's amazing and also hard to find. Um, but literally the story is about this family of <laughs> that goes to this like um, gardens. It's like a palatial gardens. Like, like you go to like botanical gardens, but it's an estate, right? That's the botanical gardens, but there's monsters. So every single page, right, it starts in the beginning and as you open the page, like dad, or I think the one of the uncles is is eaten by a monster behind the hedge. And then like the next one is like a sister is carried off by like a wyvern into the sky. And so it's like, and it's Edward Gorey. So it's very visual and then it's his very signature art. And then you get to the end and all that's left is poor little Neville, who's like the youngest. And he's like, well, I guess it was for the best anyway. Like everyone's <laughs> gone. They're dead. They've been eaten by monsters. It's, it's been a long day. And he's like leaving the park by himself. It's night now. And he's like, I guess it was for the best anyway. <laughs> and that has always made me appreciate horror because it's about survival. Mm. It's about showing, hey, we are, people have been in these extreme situations and they managed to come out and come through the other side. It's like, if you can survive a zombie apocalypse, what is a Saturday morning at Costco, right? And it's just one of those things for me that it's it's always been sort of an escape and sort of a kind of a balm. It's like, everything seems really bad, but my teacher's not a vampire, right? And so it could be worse. And so for me, horror is always about that surviving and like learning that you can endure even really terrible things. Mm. you, Kenna? I don't think there's a lot left for me to add. I thought it was pretty comprehensive. I like I like what Romina said about the frankness of horror because I feel mm -hmm. like it, I it's certainly a um you know for, you're you're forced to to confront really sort of extreme situations of human experience and I think kids I mean all readers really we seek out uh we seek out these uh powerful you know stories that it, well or they they at least um you know uh elicit powerful reactions from us um and horror tends to, I guess, you know, deal with life um, and death. And I, yeah, I, I agree with Justina as well. Like kids are, it's it's a way, I think with kids, they're sort of testing the boundaries of your own uh, bravery and experience, you know, that what would I do uh, question or how would I deal with this? Um, and I think those kind of stories are just uh, always compelling 
for uh, especially for young readers who, who are still relatively like their life, their pool of life experience is still relatively small compared to an adult. So this is like it's like getting to dip your toe in without like doing the cliff dive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something else you said, Romana, really struck me. Um, you're talking about the honesty of horror and how like I, I think I'm remembering what you said correctly, that parents tend to like soften that a little bit or adults tend to soften some of like the hard realities of of the world for kids. And um, that made me think a lot about Ophi's ghosts, just, you know, just like the way, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna have to tell my daughter about lynching, obviously. That's a terrible thing to have to talk about with a child who's just learning about the world and you don't wanna like crush their dreams, but there's something about um, hearing about it in a fantasy context or a horror context um, where nobody's, nobody's telling you like, oh, well, this happened a long time ago. And um, they're trying to like soften the blow. You can just sort of like experience it in the context of the book and then have your reaction to it and then have that reaction as you go ab about the rest of your life and learn about the world from there. Um, and that's something that I appreciate about middle grade horror that I think I see kids responding strongly to, just like not not being talked down to, which is something you also mentioned, Justina, um, because kids are people too. And they deserve to be treated with the same sort of respect as every adult. So, yeah. Um, we've been talking a little bit about reactions and I'm wondering what sort of reactions you've gotten from readers about your book since they've been out, because they've, uh, they've been out for a few years um, for each of you and quite a few for you, Kenneth. Um, Romina, how have you heard from readers about your book? What what sort of things do you hear back about it? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm very honored by um, uh, by readers who have uh, told me that they find joy and appreciation for the characters and uh, like the. And the, and the world that they represent. So it's like my aunt is a monster, even though there is uh, some uh, supernatural element there and it also touches on a little bit on like uh, grief and uh, death, fake death. <laughs> um, it's also a book that is about the wonders of the world, you know, just like how uh, fun and amazing it is to be living in the world on us that is just full of like all these like interesting and like compelling and like really like cool places and uh like like histories and rituals and food and all that stuff like we just have so much of that and uh, I'm always glad to hear um uh, the readers like understanding that and appreciating that you know both child and adult Mm. So, yes. Justina, how about you? What sort of reactions have you gotten for your book? I have gotten everything from <laughs> adults coming up and telling me how much they love the book and they were, bought it for their kids and they decided to take it and read it for themselves, which I, I think is hilarious, um, to a lot of handwritten notes from kids, which is kind of cool. I have a P.O. box just for that purpose, honestly, <laughs> because there's nothing like getting a kid a letter like written in pencil from a kid that is like, I really liked your story, but here's some ways you can improve it. <laughs> and I'm like, fair enough. Um, but yeah, I think I think one of the things that I'm really proud about that book is it is kind of like you said, it, it is that entryway into a conversation. I've had quite a few notes from from parents who were like, yeah, my child read this book at school, really liked it, brought it to me, had some questions. We had a great conversation about what America used to look like, you know, mm -hmm. why these things are. Because even though it's on the page, it's not really on the page for kids. So if they're if they're younger readers and they have no context for it, they just kind of read past it. Um, and I think that's for me, that's always a success. If like if I can have, if I can make a difficult conversation easier and make sure it happens before like something bad has happened because somebody didn't know something, I think that's that's a success. I'm just, man, I'm just writing to have fun and I hope people have fun writing my books. But if you get something from it as well, that's that's awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Kenneth? What sort of reactions have you gotten? Mostly I, I hear from parents and therapists asking me to stop writing for children. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, over the years I've had, I, it's been such a, a range every, I mean, I think the book is sort of, 
nebulous might not be the right word, but it's 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 a uh, um, capacious enough that I think people have had such wide ranging reactions to it. I, you know, I I I've heard people say it, this book it's about obsession. I've heard it's about you know it's a commentary on eugenics. Um, it's about anxiety. It's about mental health issues, and then. I'm kind of most pleased when kids read it and think it's just about a really, really big evil wasp queen <laughs> <laughs> trying to like take the hero's baby and replace it with some weird wasp baby. And that I'm happy with that because I think everything, all those other things that people think are in there, they're in there too. But I think um, I'm happy for it to be read more in that sort of fairy tale form. And I think the other stuff trickles, it trickles down eventually. Hmm. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about um, some other horror writers that you are really appreciating right now. Um, so let's start specifically with middle grade horror authors. Are there any middle grade horror authors working right now that just like really speaks to you and you feel really jazzed about? Um, Kenneth, why don't we start with you on this one? Oh, I don't read enough. I'm, I'm out of date. I mean, you know, the people that I I like for middle grade or obvious, like, you know, Neil Gaiman's Coraline. I mean, Rule Doll is long gone, but I mean, some of his stuff really qualifies as kind of horror too. I mean, like the witches or, uh, I don't know. I mean, there, there's always, there's a grotesque element in so many of his books um, that I think appeals to kids. I mean, the story, if I can just put a plug in for an old story, which was the one that I, I encountered first as a kid and that stayed with me is The Monkey's Paw you know, which is like the best story about careful what you wish for. And when that when I heard that story it was told, I think it was read aloud to me. It's just, you know, you'll never hear a knock at the door the same way after you read that story. Um, so it's still, you know, to me, it's still a pretty great story. Christina, how about you? Who are some people who you're excited to read right now? Um, I read a lot of middle grade horror. Actually, it's kind of during the pandemic, I fell into it and I've never left and mostly because I don't want to. Um, <laughs> but I read I read Catherine Arden's Small Spaces. Um, I guess it's a trilogy now, or are we on four books? I can't remember. Four. We're on four books. Yeah. So it's a trilogy plus one. I don't know what it's a series, <laughs> um, which I think is fabulous and creepy. And I think it's it's perfect for those like scaredy cats who want to read quarter four but aren't quite there. Um, I love um the forgotten girl and i cannot remember the uh the author now and i oh i'm so mad and then <laughs> um i am halfway through this and it's graham annabelle and it's called I I it's backwards for you it's fairy tales from the school of screams mm -hmm. and it is so much fun it is it is creepy and uh thank you india hill brown thank you for the chat um and the forgotten girl by india hill brown which is a beautiful read alike if you liked opie's ghosts um and it's a former summer scares book that i'm being told from from the <laughs> from the studio um and then also uh that the eerie tales school screams just because um if you if you have a future Junji Ito reader in your house, or maybe somebody in your house who's like, I want to read Junji Ito, but they're just a little too young mm -hmm. for it, um, that's a great read alike. And then get something you can hand your, your kids and say, how about this instead? Because I do think there is, there isn't nearly as much graphic novels in the middle grade horror space as I would like, but that might be just because I always want more, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that book is a really good like baby body horror <laughs> um, read for little kids. I that one's so great. Um, Romina, what about you? What's some what's some middle grade horror that you're excited about right now? <clears throat> uh, well, <laughs> it's been a really long time since I read uh like horror kidnet uh like basically since when I was last a <laughs> child. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've moved on to like um like more mature like horror uh and the classics, but with the things that I used to read as a kid and that is still influential to me to this day, like as uh new games. Uh I enjoyed Coraline, but the thing the book that is most influential to me was the graveyard book. Mm -hmm. Uh that was the story that uh made me realize that I could actually write the things that I was interested on, about. And that uh, was the gateway to um, me 
uh, learning and starting to write stories for myself. Mm -hmm. And there's also uh, Chris Priestley's Uncle Montag's Tales of Tower. Um, like, it was just like a bunch of short stories about like, you know, it's, it's more gothic than really scary, but uh, I really enjoyed the storytelling in it. Um, and then there's also um, the aesthetics of Grace Grimley, Tim Burton, and then... Uh, tons of other like uh TV shows, you know, like TV series like uh Growing Up Creepy, uh the Scary Godmother film, which doesn't look great uh because of the outdated 3D, but it's like, you know, you got this really like uh odd, um like dark uh like auntie who is like really like uh happy go lucky and she's surrounded by like vampires and werewolves and all sorts of like creepy colleagues as her BFFs. so that was like really fun for me <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah those were the things that um I really enjoyed as a kid cool um since this is generally a library program I would also like to talk a little bit about how um you use your library how libraries have helped you um how has a library helped you as a writer for horror for kids? And I imagine this could take many forms. Um, Justina, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I actually, my local library is two blocks from my house. So it's a little cold today, but usually when they're open, usually in the week, a couple times a week, I'll just take a stroll down there and see what's on the shelves, right? So what's new, what's coming in, and like what kids are reading. Just because my kid now, they're... 16 so I'm a little bit out of the middle grade phase and just in the angst phase um and so it's really kind of cool to go down there and then also a lot of times I'll find things that I don't know because I used to be you know back when I was very active on Twitter I used to see a lot of stuff that was coming out now because everyone's kind of gone to different platforms and social media it feels a little bit fragmented and stovepiped I find it hard to keep up with what's coming out so librarians are great for that because um, especially in the middle grade section there's always something new you know and, and just asking a kids librarian like hey what are kids reading now and they're like this is what we can't keep on the shelf so I think last time I was there I got handed uh Five Nights at Freddy's there's like a whole big mm -hmm. book series for Five Nights at Freddy's that kids like which is like for me I'm like that's just a rip off of Ch Chuck E. Cheese yeah but like <laughs> yeah so like I, I love libraries I think libraries are, are probably my it's my favorite place to be still I, I can't buy all the books I want because I'm still not a billionaire, but libraries kind of fulfill that need for me. Amanda, how about you? How have libraries helped you in your work? Uh, so libraries are a huge part of my process. So um, like, I think every book that I've written have, has always required a some amount of research um, especially uh, my adult books that tend to be more on like historical fiction. Uh, so I've always relied on uh, library collections and archives to ac access like uh, journal articles and uh, books and uh, like images and all sorts of things like uh, in relation to whatever it is that I am uh, researching about. And I really appreciate, you know, that, you know, just having, like, the collections, like, digitized and, like, accessible, especially as someone who uh, comes from a country where there is little to no support for libraries. And also as someone who is, uh, like, international, you know, because... Uh, Australia has a really good library system, but it is not as uh like well funded or even as huge, you know, in terms of like collections, uh, as uh libraries in the US or in the UK. So, uh, yeah. So I just like, you know, I owe a great deal to uh the work of librarians and archivists. Uh, you know, in like making these resources as accessible to as many people as possible. Hmm. How about you, Ken? 
Well, I noticed your question was phrased in a very specific way. It was how the library has helped you as a writer of horror, which seems oh, a bit yeah. eating. Like, I mean, librarians can be scary sometimes, <laughs> for sure. Um, even mean sometimes when it comes to that self-checkout. But I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm, I'm digressing. I mean, li libraries have been a huge, you know, thing for me always from, you know, visiting the bookmobile when I was a kid. I, I take my, my kids every Saturday to the library. Um, it's just... Uh, it's just good to see all those books <laughs> all together and, and to see, you know, the, what the new releases are. So it's a, it's a great sort of education for me and just uh, on, on keeping abreast of what's out. And also just, I do a huge amount of research. Um, uh, every book I write, even if it's fantasy or sci-fi or, you know, like bats and, and, it, and um, I still prefer books like physical books. I know the library, you know, contains multitudes now digitally and I use that, but um, I still just like having the book. I still feel there's an authority to the book and uh, I like being able to hold it and have it and read it and go back to it. Um, so it's just, it's been indispensable in all its forms. Uh, that is a great note to end on because we are um, at time. Uh, thank you so much to all three of you for talking about horror with us today. Um, this has been a lot of fun and I hope everybody goes out to read your books because they're all fantastic and I love them all. <clears throat> On Monday, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones. Um, and don't forget to register for other two Summer Scares panels happening Thursday, March 21st and Monday, March 25th, and you can see information about that here. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar, and one more huge, huge thank you to our panelists, Romaina, Kenneth, and Justina, and to you for helping us celebrate the Summer Scares program. Thanks. <laughs>